So copies of this text, The Dialogue of the Two Sages, are found in a few manuscripts dating from about the 12th to the 15th century. And based on the language that's used in the text, scholars suggest that it could be as old as the 10th century. So this is what we're talking about today, the dialogue of the two sages. So luckily for us, several of these manuscripts in, um, contain explanatory notes, glosses or marginalia, which can be helpful in understanding it because it's quite an obscure text. If you tried to read it or you've ever tried to read it, you'll know it's a bit like, what the heck is this? So you may know that there are a number of Celtic texts which are set out as dialogues. Especially in the British tradition, we have two dialogues involving Myrthen, one between him and his sister, another between Myrthen and Taliesin. There's also a dialogue between Arthur and the Eagle. And each of these texts is unique and reflects the lore surrounding the speakers, as well as the preoccupations of the period in which they were created. But it's unlikely that any of them reflect conversations which actually took place. So these dialectical methods of teaching abstract ideas were popular in antiquity and right up into the Middle Ages. And sometimes this was a method for genuinely arriving at the truth. Think of Plato's dialogues. But it often was reduced to the student uh, having been taught to know the correct answer to certain questions. So the student was simply parroting answers they'd already learned. For example, the questions and answers in a Roman Catholic catechism class tend to work like that. So we often see Taliesin asking rhetorical questions as if to imply that he has knowledge that at least some of his listeners lack because they're unlearned. And it's not unusual for him to aim these passages at the Christian clergy or at poets that he considers lesser in knowledge than he is. In the medieval period, dialogues also became a literary container for prophetic material. Often one character repeatedly questions a prophet about what they see or what will happen. Some of the Merthyn dialogues tend to go like that. And these prophecies might be religious in nature, often predicting the dire consequences of human misbehavior and catastrophic Book of Revelation style scenarios. So at other times, the prophecies might be political, perhaps predicting that the author's group will be victorious in a war or will finally rise up and conquer their oppressors. Uh, these prophecies might be given a veneer of believability by putting into the mouth of the great figure like Merthyn or Taliesin things that have already happened. So first they prophesy things which we think, oh, well, in their day, they wouldn't have known this was going to happen. Of course, the thing is written in our day. And then it moves on to predictions about the future. So this makes it easy to think, oh, this person was a great prophet. And Irish literature also contains other passages in which one character questions another about their knowledge of lore. Uh, like Cahullan questioning Emmer in The Wooing of Emmer, in which she demonstrates how well-educated she is. And sometimes she replies with what we call kennings. A kenning is described in the dictionary as a conventional metaphoric name for something. When people talk about white horses on the sea waves, uh, we know that it's the white foam on the sea waves because that's a kenning we all know. We most, everybody knows that a couch potato isn't actually a root vegetable. So kennings generally take this much further though. So you need to have insider knowledge or a particular type of education to understand them. Like Cockney rhyming slang is an example of this. So give us a tune on the old Joanna means please play the piano. And if you're going outside for a laugh and a joke, you're actually going out for a smoke. 
So some cockneys can carry on a conversation in rhyming slang, which is pretty much impenetrable to an outsider. They often take it a step further by omitting the rhymed word so that I was having a laugh means I was smoking a cigarette. Their fellow Cockney speaker makes the connection to a laugh and a joke and understands. So Cockney rhyming slang was partly developed to confound the police, but other kennings may serve to hide knowledge from outsiders or rivals. New recruits to the military find themselves thrown into a sea of jargon and mysterious acronyms, which they'll learn over time, and then they'll use them against the wave of new recruits when, when they're not new anymore. The poets of Ireland and Wales combine kennings with veiled references to lesser known lore and the, all these demonstrations of knowledge of stories and genealogies as a way of setting themselves above most of their listeners. The king or courtier who's able to penetrate these things knows themselves to be well-educated and wise and one of the cognoscenti, while the listeners are left to get what they can, pick up the crumbs of the poet's words. And meanwhile, the apprentice bards will be hanging on every word determined to learn it all. So as consumers of Celtic texts a thousand years later, or maybe a hundred years later in the case of James Joyce, we're left struggling and there's a danger that we may not realize what the poet is even doing and take them literally. So, of course, a dialogue may also be a frame in which a story or a series of stories are told, like the tales of the elders of Ireland, um, in which St. Patrick dialogues with like the ghosts of Fenian warriors is just one long dialogue, really, in which it frames lots of stories about Finn McCool and his men. So as we explore this text, I think you'll find that it contains elements of all these traditions, philosophical discourse, kennings and other obscurities intended to entertain the cognoscenti and confound the ignorant, telling the story of the emergence of a great poet and as a vehicle for some fire and brimstone prophecy. So kind of watch out for these elements as we go along. Fortunately for us, Celtic scholars have unraveled a great deal of the meanings in the dialogue of the two sages. So that work actually starts quite early with Cormac's glossary, which cites the text directly in a few cases and offers information about some of the other words and phrases used, which Irish scholars might not otherwise be able to figure out. And there's also all this marginalia, this, these glosses in the different copies of this text, which helps a lot. So this work is then taken up again in the 19th century, primarily by Whitley Stokes, who gathers up the glosses from the various manuscripts and uses them to annotate his translation of the text, which we're about to explore in depth. So I'm going to lean quite heavily on Stokes' work today just to help us make some sense of this text, because he actually does, I think, as good a job as anyone ever has ever done. So I want to start by reading you his synopsis of the text, which I hope will give us a bit of an aerial view of the forest before we start to look at the trees. So on the death of Adney, the chief poet of Ulster, his official robe, his poet's robe was conferred on Ferkertnia, a famous elderly bard. Adney's young, beardless son, Nida, who was then studying in Scotland under Archi Echbel, heard these tidings from a sea wave and proceeded to Awen to claim the robe. At the instigation of Brickru and in the temporary absence of Ferkertnia, Neither donned the poet's robe, fixed a beard of grass on his face, and sat down in the poet's chair. Ferkertnir returned and addressed the young man indignantly, 
Who is this poet, a poet around whom lies the robe with its splendor, whose beard is forged of grass? Neither replies respectfully that he has been a pupil of a renowned master. Ferkertnje then asks him whence he has come. Neither answers with a string of kennings and puts a like question to Ferkertnje. Ferkertnje replies with a similar string and then demands Neither's name. Neither answers with ten more kennings. And thou, he asks, O oh, my senior, what is thy name? Six kennings are given in answer. And then Ferkertnje asks, what art the lad practices? The answer is a series of metaphors drawn from an Irish poet's life in the early Middle Ages. A like question to Ferkertnje produces a like reply, much of which is obscure. Then each asks the other whither he is going and where he is gone. The answers are in the secret poetic language, the meaning of which can often only be guessed. The poets then asked each other, whose son art thou? Evasive riddling answers are given. Ferkertnje then seeks news of the condition of Ireland. Neither replies with a cheerful optimism of youth and in return requests Ferkertnje for his tidings. Ferkertnje then, with an old man's pessimism, foretells all manner of physical and moral evils, including the raids of the Vikings on Ireland and the decay of religion, art, poetry, and virtue in a country ruined by invasion and intertribal strife. The birth of the Antichrist is prophesied and the perishing of the world. Knowest thou, says Ferkertnje at last, who is above thee? God and Ferkertnje is the substance of the answer. Neither then gives up the poet's robe to Ferkertnje, rises from the poet's chair, and is about to cast himself at the old man's feet when Ferkertnje stops him. The piece ends with reciprocal blessings from Neither and his acknowledgement of Ferkertnje as his second father, in other words, as his teacher. So some of you may recognize the names of Neither's two teachers, from another story. So let me fill that in a bit. When he's in Scotland, neither is the student of Achi Echbeil, which means Achi Horsemouth. In one of the versions of the story of Kuroi Makdara and Blathna, which some of you studied in the class with me, Achi Echbeil is in that story too. He's called Echte Echbeil, but it's the same guy. And he's kidnapped Blathna. He's presented as a wizard and a sorcerer who has a cauldron and some magical cows, and he lives in sort of Kintyre or Isla or something. Kuroi steals Blathnat and these treasures, but she ultimately plots with her lover Kuhalin, and Kuroi is killed. Now, Kuroi has a poet who's also called Ferkertnya, who takes revenge on Blathnat for the killing of Kuroi by grabbing hold of her and throwing himself and Blathna to their deaths. But it's not the same Ferkertnya as the one in today's story, or at least so we're meant to believe. So these are two separate, uh, just like there are two famous poets, at least called Avergin in Irish lore, there are at least two Ferkertnyas. So what I've done here is I've just, uh, this is in the public domain. So I've just copied and pasted this onto slides page by page out of Whitley Stokes. We're not going to read every word. And I've, I've put what I just read to you kind of divided up as we go through the thing. So you can see Stokes commentary that I just read to you kind of lining up with where we are in the text. So you can have a copy of this after, afterward, I'll post it on the the page so that you can you can have it if you want to if you're just dying to study this text so adney this um was the olive of ireland in science and poetry so an olive is like a great teacher he had a son who to it neither now that son went to learn science in scotland now this word science keeps coming up and i think we could take it to mean knowledge we might take it to mean deep knowledge or esoteric knowledge, but essentially I would take it to mean knowledge. And Stokes has 
translated it not wrongly as science, but that's the sense in which we should take it as a particular kind of skill. So his son had gone to learn science in Scotland with Achi Echbel, and he stayed with Achi until he was skilled in science. Now, one day the lad fared forth till he was on the brink of the sea, for the poets deemed that on the brink of water, it was always a place of revelation of science. So this is kind of a reference to that liminal space of walking on the shore. He heard a sound in the wave, to wit a chant of wailing and sadness, and it seemed strange to him. So the lad cast a spell upon the wave that it might reveal to him what the matter was. And thereafter it was declared to him that the wave was bewailing his father, Adni, after his death, and that Adni's robe had been given to fair Kertnir the poet, who had taken the olive ship in place of Neva's father. So the story goes on. He goes back to the house where he's been staying and he's got some brothers staying with him. They all gather themselves up. They make several attempts to leave Kintyre and go back to Ireland. But every time they get a little ways down the road and they see something strange and they don't know what it's called or they don't know why it's called what it's called. So they go back to Achiechvel and get some more instruction. So they realize they're not quite, uh, they haven't learned everything yet that they need to learn. But eventually, you know, they make it to Awen Vacha. I'm just right here. Thus then went the youth with a silvern branch above him. For this is what they used above the Andrews, the apprentice bards or young bards a branch of gold above the olives, a branch of copper over the rest of the poets. So they go on to Awen Vaca and Brickru tricks neither. He tells him that Fairkertne is dead. Actually, Fairkertne is just out of town, you know? But he says, so you might as well go and ahead and have his robe and sit in his chair and take your father's place. Of course, Fairkertnia comes back. In fact, Brickru, who's always stirring up trouble, goes to him and says to him, it were sad, O Fairkertnia, that thou should be put out of the olive ship of Ireland today. A young, honorable man has taken the olive ship in Allen. Thereat Fairkertnia was wroth, and he entered the palace and stood on the floor with his hand on the beam, so that there he said, who is this poet, etc., etc., and so we're just about to get to the actual dialogue. If you'd like to delve a little deeper into the topics in my videos, you might enjoy taking one of my online classes. You can find out more about them at the link which is on your screen now. You can also support my work on Ko-fi or by becoming a patron. You'll also find free content to read on my Patreon page and on my website. All the links are in the description. It kind of repeats the story again a little bit. And here we are at the dialogue. Who is this poet? A poet around whom lies the robe with its splendor. Who would display himself after chanting poetry? According to what I see, he's only a pupil. Of grass is the arrangement of his great beard. Now, apparently, according to the text, a bit that I didn't bother to read out to you, Neath's magic is sufficient that to most people, his beard did not look like it was made of grass. It looked real, but Ferkertnia can see through it. In the place for chanting poetry, who is this poet? A contentious poet. I never heard the secret of the sense of Adni's son. I never heard of him with ready knowledge. A mistake by my letters is Neath's seat. In other words, you're sitting in the wrong chair, buddy. And this is the honorific speech, which neither uttered to Ferkertnia. Now, we can see from this that Ferkertnia knows who neither is, but based on his age, suggests that he's in the chair too soon. An ancient one, oh my senior, every sage is a co corrective sage. A sage is the reproach of every ignorant person. But before he knows the wrath against us, he should see what reproach what evil sap is in us. Welcome is even the piercing sense of wisdom. 
slight is the blemish of a young man unless his art be rightly questioned. Step, chief, a more lawful way. Thou showest badly, thou hast shown badly. Thou yieldest to me very meagerly the food of learning. I have drained the dug of a man goodly, treasurous. In other words, he's drunk the knowledge from at the breast of Ochi Ekbel. So note the emphasis that Neve's reply is respectful. It's witty, but it's still within the bounds of being respectful. He suggests that her character is too quick to judge him. A question, O instructive lad, says Ferkertna, whence hast thou come? Not hard to say, from the heel of a sage, from a confluence of wisdom, from perfection of goodness, from brightness of sunrise, from the hazels of poetic art. Now um, we're getting into the glosses and I've paraphrased Whitley Stokes' explanations of the glosses, just to simplify them, shorten them in some cases. So from the hazels of poetic art means from Nectan's well, where the hazels grow, right? This from circuits of splendor, out of which they measure truth according to excellences, in which righteousness is taught, in which falsehood sets like the sun sets, in which colors are seen, and the gloss here says, white when he is praised, black when he is satirized, and speckled or many colored, in other words, brightly arrayed, when he is proclaimed, in which poems are freshened. And thou, O my senior, whence hast thou come? And fair Kertny answers, not hard to say, along the columns of age, the six ages of man along the streams of Galleon in Leinster, from the source of the Boyne, along the elf mound of Nechtan's wife, in other words, the Bruna Banya, along the forearm of Nuida's wife. So Nuida's wife is Boan still, and this is a bend in the Boyne that he's talking about. Along the land of the sun, now the gloss here for 36 and 37, along the land of the sun and the dwelling of the moon, says he knows the place of the moon during the day and the sun at night. Along the young one's navel string, in other words, the beginning of knowledge happens at birth. A question, O instructing lad, what is thy name? Not hard to say. Very small, very great, very bright, very hard. Seems like only small and great are really clearly glossed. Small in person, in other words, young, great in knowledge. Angriness of fire, fire of speech, noise of knowledge, well of wealth. And the gloss is, I am a well with abundance of knowledge. Sword of song, straight artistic with bitterness out of fire. And thou, O my senior, what is thy name? Not hard, nearest in omens, explanatory champion of declaration for interrogatory, inquiry of science, weft of art, I'd condense science, casket of poetry, I preserve poetry, abundance from a sea, multitudinous is the sea of knowledge. A question, O oh instructing lad, what art dost thou practice? Not hard to say, reddening a countenance, piercing flesh, tinging bashfulness, tossing away shamelessness, fostering poetry. In other words, practicing satire. To search for fame, wooing science, art for every mouth. Diffusing knowledge, in other words, scattering knowledge Stripping speech, editing, or clarifying poetry in a little room. Now, this gets interesting. So the gloss here says that this refers to the practice of kings sharing their beds with their bards. Now, this is referred to in a few places in Ireland and I think Wales, too. So you have to get your hand around the vast difference in medieval sleeping arrangements to modern sleeping arrangements. So, you, you know, even in the Victorian period, people slept together, many in a bed often. In the medieval period, the king was probably one of the few people that actually had a bed. 
and his uh, body servants often shared his bed and his bard often shared his bed. I assume the bed was rather large, you know, because he was a king. So he had this big bed and all his favorite people got in with him. <laughs> and the bard was very often the king's bedfellow. So going back to line 65, I am wont to be in a bed along with a king. And 66, a sage's cattle, literally poetry, which is exchanged for cattle. A stream of science, abundant teaching, smooth tales, the delight of kings. And thou, O oh my senior, what art dost thou practice? Hunting for support, in other words, seeking patronage, establishing peace, arranging a troop. So a poet has a retinue like his own little personal soldiers who go about with him. Tribulation of young men. Now this is glossed again as a reference to being the king's bedfellow. And this doesn't sound quite so good. So you can make of this what you will, but is the tribulation of young men a reference to perhaps younger bards being the king's bedfellow and an unwilling party to some sexual uh, behavior. We don't know for sure, but it certainly sounds like that. And that's not just me. That's a common interpretation of this, the tribulation of young men celebrating art. Again, the source of the Boyne poetic inspiration, a palette with a king. There we are again. And then some bits that are hard to read or hard for Whitley Stokes to understand. And we come to the shield of Ahernia. So Ahernia is a famous satirist in the Ulster cycle period. And his shield was his satire, the shield of Ahernia. A share of new wisdom from the stream of science, fury of inspiration, structure of mind, art of small poems, clear arrangement, ruddy tales, in other words, warlike stories or poems. A celebrated road, the gloss says this refers to the law. The law is a celebrated road. And of course, the poets often, part of their work was upholding and uh, knowing the law. A pearl in a setting, suckering science after a poem. So in other words, ex expounding or explaining what a poem means. A question, O oh, instructing lad, what is it that thou undertakes? Not hard to say, to go into the plain of age, into the mountain of youth, into the hunting of age, into following a king, might be death, into an abode of clay. Obviously, that means the grave. Between candle and fire, so between burial and judgment, between battle and its horror, this may refer to the poets sometimes acted as peacemakers or emissaries to make peace, uh, but they also attended battles and made poetry right there during the battle. Among the, the mighty men of Terra, Terra is a, a kind of a king of the Fomorians uh, who has to do with the sea among the stations of something that was illegible, among the streams of knowledge. And thou, O oh my sage, what is it that thou undertakest? Into the mountain of rank, into the communion of sciences, into the lands of the men of knowledge, into the breast of poetic revision, into the inver or harbor of bounties, into the fair of the king's boar, so the king's boar means the king's son. And it's glossed as, in other words, he's going into a place of many luxuries, into the small respect of new men, into the slopes of death, wherein is abundance of great honors. A question, O instructed lad, what is the path thou hast come? Not hard to say. On the white plain of knowledge, on a king's beard, on a word of age, on the back of a plowing ox is glossed as on the back of my own hard work, basically, my own hard work at poetry. On the light of a summer moon, which is curiously glossed this way, a fine Sunday is followed by a fine Monday. This was a kind of a weather saying that if Sunday was fine, Monday would be fine. It's interesting that they get that out of on the light of a summer moon, but there you go on goodly cheeses, mast and fruit, 
on the dews of a goddess, corn and milk, on scarcity of corn, on a ford of fear, on the thighs of a goodly abode. And thou, my senior, on what path hast thou come? Not hard to say. On Lou's horse rod. So apparently there was a saying that Lou invented a fair and a ball, in other words, for playing. This is referring to the Lunas affairs, right? And a horse whip. Lou's horse rod, in other words, is a riding crop or horse whip. On the breasts of soft women, on the hair of a wood, on the head of a spear, on a gown of silver, on a chariot frame without a tire, on a tire without a chariot god, it's like Taliesin, on the three ignorances of the Mackin dog. This is a curious one. So that there's two possible glosses for this. He knows not when he would die or how he would die or where he would die is one. The other is a sod of birth, a sod of death, and a sod of burial. In other words, these are the three places that you don't know. You don't know where you will be born, where you will die, or where you will be buried. And thou, O instructing lad, of whom art thou son? Not hard to say. I am son of poetry. Of course, his father is a famous poet. Poetry, son of scrutiny. Scrutiny, son of meditation. Meditation, son of lore. Lore, son of inquiry. Enquiry, son of investigation. Investigation, son of great knowledge. Great knowledge, son of great sense. Great sense, son of understanding. Understanding, son of wisdom. Wisdom, son of the three gods of poetry. And supposedly this applies to these three chaps who are sometimes considered the sons of Bridget, Brian, Eucher, and he's sometimes called Eucharva, I think it is. Eure. I just want to go back to this passage because I think it's really good. Poetry, the son of scrutiny, scrutiny, the son of meditation, uh, son of lore, son of enquiry, son of investigation, son of great knowledge, son of great sense. Um, I sometimes feel this with my own students that they ask me questions which they could easily find out the answers to by a little bit of investigation and inquiry to find the same great knowledge that I find for them. Um, not that I begrudge the work, you know, but it's, it kind of struck me. This is, this is how you get where you're going. He asks Fairkertna whose son he is. And he says, nor hard to say. I am the son of the man who has been and was not born. So riddles here. In other words, Adam. Adam has been but was not born. He has been buried in his mother's womb. In other words, he's been buried in the earth. He has been baptized after death in Christ's passion. His first presence, death, betrothed him. In other words, original sin. First utterance of every living one, the cry of every dead one, lofty A is his name. In other words, Adam. That's like, just in case you didn't get the riddle, a question, O instructing lad, hast thou tidings? Now, this is where we get into this sort of prophecy section. And Stokes points out that Neither replies with the cheerful optimism of youth. And I think you'll notice that the beginning of this prophecy is reminiscent of one of the poems of Aragin, of the Sons of Mill, and also reminiscent of the Morrigan's first prophecy at the end of the second battle Moitura. Sea fruitful with fish and seaweed, strand overrun with blossom, woods, or sorry, woods smile with blossom, wooden blades flee. Now this is glossed as Perhaps the blades with poison depart. In other words, heathenism or something like divining rods or magic wands. Fruit trees flourish. This is literally apples in the text, but supposedly it represents Christ. I wouldn't have guessed that. Cornfields grow. Bee swarms are many. A radiant world. Happy place. Kindly summer. Armies with pay. Sunny kings. Wondrous wisdom. Battle goes away. Everyone to his own art, men of valor, needlework for women, treasures laugh, valor abundant, every art is complete, 
fair every good man, good every tiding, tidings good. And thou, O my senior, hast thou tidings. Now, if you were still reading by this point when you checked out the text, you'll know that Fakertna is about to just hit the downer side of everything. And again, this is a little reminiscent of the Morrigan's second prophecy at the end of the second, second Battle of Moitwira. I have indeed terrible tidings, evil the time, which will always be, wherein chiefs will be many, wherein honors will be few. The living will quash their judgments. The cattle of the world will be barren. Men will cast off modesty. The champions of great lords will go. Men will be bad. Kings will be few. Usurpers will be many. Disgraces will be crowds. Every man will be blemished. Chariots will perish along the race course. Foes will consume Niles Plain, in other words, Ireland. Truth will not safeguard wealth. Sentries around churches will be fought. Every art will be buffoonery. Every falsehood will be chosen. Everyone will pass out of his proper state through pride and arrogance, so that neither rank, nor old age, nor honor, nor dignity, nor art, nor instruction will be served. Every skillful person will be broken. And he apparently means sort of financially broken, because his things will be seized by the poor. It sounds like a revolution. Every king will be a pauper. Every noble will be contemned. Every base born will be set up so that neither God nor man will be worshipped. Lawful princes will perish before usurpers by the oppressions of the men of the black spears. Now, this is the Vikings, and they're referred to a number of times. In fact, so often that after a while I stop flagging it up because it becomes obvious. Belief will be destroyed. Offerings will be distributed. Floors will be gone under by housebreakers. And it's glossed as this will happen in churches. Of course, it's being glossed by somebody in a monastery, so that's not surprising. Apparently, if the churches were impossible to break into, the Viking raiders would dig under the floor of the church to get in that way to steal all the lovely gold stuff. Cells will be undermined, churches will be burnt, niggardly storerooms will be laid waste. In other words, they'll be stealing from things that there's no point in even going there. Inhospitality will destroy flowers. In other words, the, the mast and fruit crops. Through false judgments, fruits will fall. His path in winter to the hospitalier will perish for everyone. In other words, there won't be anywhere good to stay if you're traveling. Hounds will inflict conflicts on bodies so that every will and will upon his following through darkness and grudge and niggardliness at the final end of the world, a refuge to poverty, stinginess and grudging. So this gets very long and very dark and I'm not going to read it all. You can read it for yourself and the glosses are all here. There seem to be several themes that are constantly referred to. One of them is a loss of hospitality. Another is a loss of learning. And another one is the Vikings. So these three things seem to be particularly concerning. Uh, churches being raided and people being ungenerous, inhospitable. And the loss of learning. Letters will be forgotten. Words will be given false meaning. Outlanders and rabble. And also a sense that there's too many people in some districts. Um, every territory will be an excessive number. Um, so perhaps this was Norse settlers or people being driven out of areas by Vikings and settling in, in other areas and making those areas too crowded. I don't know. So anyway, it goes on in much that vein, fathers laying with their daughters and so on. And finally, we come to the end. So Ferkertnia says finally to Neva, knowest thou, O little in age, great in knowledge, son of Adne, who is above thee? Easy to say. I know my God creative. I know my wisest of prophets. I know my hazel of poetry. I know my mighty God. I know that Ferkertnia is a great poet and a prophet. So Fair Kertner's prophecy, perhaps by its 
length and demonstration of so much knowledge is seen to be much greater than Adney's little, oh, it's a lovely day, isn't it, sort of prophecy. The lad then kneels to him. Thereat Neither flings to fair Kertnia the poet's robe, which he put from him, and he rose out of the poet's seat, wherein he was to cast himself under fair Kertnia's feet. Thereupon fair Kertnia said, Stay, O little in age, great in knowledge, son of Adne. Said fair Kertnia, Stay then, thou poet great, to wit in science, O son of Adne, mayst thou be magnified and glorified. So in other words, he's saying, you did really well in all these questions I asked you. Mayst thou be famous and adorned in the opinion of man and God. Mayst thou be a casket of poetry. In other words, may you preserve poetry and may you be a king's arm. In other words, at the, at the right hand of a king. Mayst thou be a rock of olives and so on. Mayst thou be the glory of Awen. Mayst thou be higher than every one. And then Neith replies, in a similar vein, bigging up fair Kertner, a casket of poetry, an expression of new wisdom. He is the intellect of perfect folk, father by son, son by father. Three fathers are read of therein, to wit, a father in age, a fleshly father, a father of teaching. My fleshly father remains not. My father of teaching is not present. So Adney is dead. Achiech Bales in Scotland, tis thou art my father in age. So, you, you know, you're my teacher now. I acknowledge thee as such. So that's the colloquy of the two sages. 